Hello, I'm Nigel Griffiths, I work at IBM in the UK. I'm recording this on September the 8th, the day this new machine comes out. It's the Power 10 processor based Enterprise E1080. We're going to look at some of the technical facts as fast as we can to get you up to speed. So let's start with the basics. The E1080 has one to four of these Keck nodes. Keck is Central Electronics Complex. Some people call them CPU drawers or units, they're all the same thing. It includes the Power 10 CPUs, the memory and the adapters. 19 inches wide, should not be a surprise. 5U high and it's 34.1 inches deep. Just to make a point that it's the same as the Power 9 E980, the model that preceded it. This is quite a long draw. If you're familiar with the Power 9s, then quite often people had to buy the rack extension out the back to allow the cabling to have the uh, room to turn. In addition to the Keck nodes, we have a system control unit, just one of these. The most important thing in it is the two fast service processors, or FSPs, and the cabling that goes out to each of those nodes. This is like the uh, the master controller. It helps uh, power up the box, powers it down, do the configuration for adapters and all that sort of thing inside the box for us. 9 inches wide, 2U high, and 30 inches deep. Very much the same dimensions as the previous E980. These Keck nodes are very much a building block and we can have a machine with one Keck, two Kecks, three Kecks or four Kecks and one system controller in all cases. So a Keck on the left hand side has four power 10 CPUs, a maximum of 16 terabytes of memory in there. There's 64 memory DIMM slots, eight PCI Gen 5 adapter slots, up to 60 CPU cores and there's four NVMe solid state drives, probably for booting a pair of virtual I.O. servers. Then if you have two kecks, well it's double that, three kecks, triple that, and four kecks, guess what? Yes, that right, quadruple all of those numbers. A regular building blocks machine. Most people are buying the four keck machines and I'll explain what they actually tend to do on day one with that. Or well, they want to grow their workloads over perhaps say the first year so they buy a two kecks now and then they add keck three and four now those do require outages typically you use live partition mobility to move all your virtual machines away from the machine then you can power it off hand it to your engineer they'll add the keck or two more kecks plug in all the cables they run diagnostics tests to make sure it's okay and hand that back to you a couple of hours later we also have the feature where we can have a number of the cpus and uh, gigabytes of memory are activated and so there's extra CPU memory in the machine that is not available to you unless you pay IBM money for activation codes and then we activate the memory or CPUs and then they suddenly become available online your virtual machines they can be boosted in size to the eight make use of the more resources most of our customers go for this thing called power enterprise pools 2.0 in this case you'll purchase a, a base amount of cpu and memory what you need to run your weekly workloads and get your job done then above that the cpus are actually there and active but you're charged on i think it's an hourly rate when you use more cpu or you need more memory to boost your performance on your database perhaps then you switch those on use them and then you switch them off and then you stop getting charged so it's very much more of a cloud model and so you'll be having a baseline that you are using and then you pay on top of that for your peak usage of cpu and memory by the hour only this is a technical video so if we take the cover off the front of a keck node we can see five great big powerful fans to provide the cooling for the machine and at the bottom we have four power supplies these are actually connected at the back the cable comes through a little little tunnel and comes out the front and plugs them in that, this way inside the keck node we can see a lot of beautiful engineering in here we'll quickly go through the various components at the top right we have the adapter cage the adapters slot in the back we'll look at that a little later then we have these uh, yellow cables these are the inter node cables that make this into one large machine by uh, sharing the memory between the processors then we actually have the heat sinks on top of the power tin chips themselves further towards the front we have the double row of slots which contain this omi memory open memory interface and we can have 64 memory cards slotted into each node then with the blue handles and there's a few scattered around the machine as well these are the voltage regulator modules some are for the cpus some for the memory and they all have light path diagnostics 
running in them. This means if we have a problem, we can pull the machine out and press a button and it will spotlight the component that we actually need to change. Make sure you remove and replace the correct component that's actually faulty. Then you can just see sticking out the front the uh, five fans that provide the cooling for the machine. More CPU information. The Power 10 chips, we have four per kick node, always four, you can't have less, and that means 16 per server. Each chip is either 10, 12, or 15 CPU cores, so the maximum we can get to is 240 cores per server. They're running SMT8, simultaneous multi-threading, so we get nearly 2,000 programs running concurrently. So there's 2,000 programs that are making progress in their running their instructions every clock cycle or so. All the processes in the server must be exactly the same. There's three options, 10 core, 12, and 15 core, and they have slightly different gigahertz ratings. 15 core being the top gun maximum number of cores. The 12 cores is quite nice because we have slightly less cores. We can run them at slightly harder and get a little bit extra in the gigahertz rating. And then we have the 10 cores running at 3.9. And there's a big discussion about which is the best option for you. Um, of course, the 15 cores cost more and the 10 cores cost less. So it's a balancing act. On the performance side, compared to Power 9, the, the threads are 20% faster, the cores are 30% faster, and of course we've got an extra 25% in the number of cores. And the number we're banding around is for the whole server in our purse for AOX workloads, around a 56% increase over Power 9, which is astonishing in a generational leap. If we go back to the memory side, we're using these new memory cards. They're designed to a standard called the Open Memory Interface, or OMI. Four different sizes of these, we tend to call them DDIMs these days, and each of these is running at a very high speed. You can see at the bottom of the card there's a little copper heatsink. Underneath here we have the buffered controller for this memory. This allows us to run at this very high speed and uh, 1.6 terabytes per second loading in and out of memory to the main CPUs. There's also this controller that's doing the main memory encryption. So the processor writes the memory to the controller, the controller encrypts it before saving it to the memory chips. This means it's completely independent of the Power 10 crypto engines that are actually on the processor. Memory is purchased in sets of four and inserted into the computer in sets of four. So if you buy the smallest 32 gig version, then your minimum size for any machine is 128 gigabytes. And we can see the four variations there. There's 64 slots per keg node. We have four nodes, of course, and that will get you up to the 64 terabytes of main memory. And it's rated at 1.8 times faster than the standard DDR memory. With the performance of our main CPU, CPUs, we have to make sure the memory keeps up and the industry standard memory dims doesn't. Now customers typically don't ever get to see it inside their computers. This is for hardware engineers only. But around the back of course there's much more fun going on. Lots of different connectors here and we'll go through those now. First then we can see where we plug in the power. We've seen where those cables come out the front and we plug them into the power supply. Not a lot of rocket science going on there. Then we have the connectors for both electrical and communications to the service processors in the system control unit. This allows the four KECs to be operated as one single computer. Then we have the eight PCIe Gen 5 adapter slots. We got the standard blind swap cassettes for these. You lower that blue handle after you've gone to the HMC and told it that you want to change the adapter slot. It will actually then power off the adapter so that uh, it's safe to remove it out. We pull out the blind swap cassette. We press the blue button on the side on the side and the top come off and then we can access very quickly the adapter in the front. This is probably the sixth or seventh generation of blind swap cassettes. These are really slick and really fast to change the adapters. Next is 32 connections that connect between this node and the other nodes. This means the CPUs in this node can talk to the memory in the other nodes, and vice versa. These are running at 32 gigabits, which is quite a big jump from power 9. If we think of in here, we look sort of through these adapters, there's four CPUs. And all of the CPUs in this machine, all four of them, are directly connected to each other. So that's one hop to get to the memory connected to another processor. Also, all of the processors on this machine are directly connected to the same processor on the other node. So this is processor 1, say. It's connected to processor 1 on the next node and the next node and the next node above that. So if this processor wants to get to the memory on another node that is directly connected to the same processor number, then that's one hop 
down these cables to get to its memory. And then if you want the uh, sort of worst case scenario, perhaps processor one in here wants to talk to processor four over here, but it directly connected to the processor four here and processor four is connected to processor four in the other kick. So that's the two hop way of getting the memory. We'll show you a little diagram of the uh, cabling in the next picture. Finally, we have up to four NVMe solid state drives. They're 800 gigabytes, a U2 format. Uh, these look pretty good to me for your VO servers. You'd have two pairs for two VO servers using the four drives. Of course, if you have multiple KECs, then you can have even more VIO servers, or perhaps use them for storage or caching. So this picture is from the IBM test labs. It's not, not my server. In here, we can see there's no fiber channel or ethernet connections going in any of the adapters. So what's remaining is in this area, this area, this area, and this one, we've got all the cables, the SMP cables that join us into one CPU and memory machine. So a few other cables, these two, these two, these two, and these two, they run down the sides and all get plugged into this area here and this area here to this two service processors. So if we take this node uh, here, uh, there's cables and this uh, CPU or processor here, there are cables coming out of here that go to the CPU above, the CPU above that, and to the CPU below that. Let's take a quick look at our PCIe I.O. adapters. The Power 9 ones have been brought forward into Power 10. This makes life simple, client technical specialists and the clients know these adapters well and which they prefer to plumb into their computer room. Adapters can be moved from uh, power 9 to power 10 servers. Of course, you'd have to pull out the two blind swap sets and move the adapter across, but that takes a handful of minutes at most. There's a tiny number of uh, replacements or updates to the adapters to be made. It's a wonderful one map of a new version of the card. There's no new Gen 5 cards available at the moment. We're waiting for our vendors to catch up. Of course, the Power 10 computer will be ready for them when they arrive because they're all Gen 5 slots here, but it also supports Gen 2, 3, 4, and 5 adapters. So our older adapters will work fine. We've got the same set of uh, Ethernet, Fiber Channel, SAN, SAS, and uh, SAS with RAID, and SAS for tape and DVD. There's also Encrypto card available, and there's a USB 2 port. I don't quite know why you would be using some technology like that, as it takes up a whole adapter slot. A lot of customers are banning USBs in the computer room for obvious data security reasons. We've also got uh, remote SAS drawers, which are the same as we have in Power9, and we have a remote PCIe adapter drawer. This needs a newer version of the adapter that actually goes into the E1080, but the drawer is the same. A quick summary of some of the facts we've gone through. Halfway down there, there's a note that requires HMC running the version 10 code that's only available on a CR1 or a CR2 HMC or the virtual HMC. So these enterprise machines strongly recommend on your first one, first power 10, you get a pair of CR2s. They're a really nice piece of kit. There's a different video on that. The CR1s are actually being withdrawn now, but if you got them, you can run those too. Lots of built-in software, mentioned the Enterprise Pools 2 before, and all our great operating systems are supported on this E1080. If you enjoyed this video, give us a thumbs up. Don't forget to, to subscribe and click the bell icon if you want to be informed as I produce new videos. Thanks for watching.